Signs of the Southland, Sunday, October 10th, 2021. Mr. Grant, it's really weird that you're now sitting next to me while we record this. It's Hi. kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be here, buddy. How you doing? Good. I mean, you went to Helen this weekend. I um, did. How was that? It was good. Food was good. It was very crowded. Uh, had to be safe. So, you know, uh, all in day's work, but it was fun. I don't know. I'd probably go back in like March next time, but it's kind of one of those things that it's like, I guess, classic Georgia person to do. I don't know. You've lived here longer than I have. Someone really likes being a tourist. I do like being a tourist. As much as I hate being a tourist, I, I do like being a tourist. Unbelievable. Well, uh, we have other things to get to uh, later today, but we did want to record a podcast because we uh, did not have the opportunity to do so last week. Do you want to you elaborate a little bit on why? Or? Yeah, uh, between uh, just busyness at work and I guess choosing to go to the sports instead of watching them from home, all of our weekend kind of just evaporated at that rate. And uh, you know what? It was it was for the best. We came back strong for this week, and, and now we have plenty, plenty to talk about. Oh, yeah. Uh, so let's, if I can find a technology device to put a timer on. Uh, I have my phone. Do you want me to pull it yeah, out? Yeah, let's, let's, let's get a timer. Let's, let's time ourselves once again. Let's throw a, how about, let's say 35 minutes. 35 minutes on the clock here. All right, let's ride. All right, and three, two, one, go. Uh, let's start with Georgia Tech Golf, which you have on the chat sheet here first off. Uh, Storm back from a, for a three-way tie uh, for first at the, you didn't put the tournament name it on it. was here. the Hamptons Intercollegiate. Mm, sound, I mean, considering Northwestern and Virginia were there, on brand. <laughs> True. Uh, and we did tie with those two schools for first place, um, given that Georgia Tech has spent brief, brief moments in the top 10 themselves this year uh, you might go well jake why are they why are they tying with northwestern virginia honestly um northwestern's a pretty solid school as is virginia we did see northwestern in glencoe last week um so not entirely unfamiliar with them either but i think the real story to get at here is not the fact that it was a tie for first was that uh, we were in first place at the end altogether because it took a monster showing in the final third decisive round with a 12 under par 276 uh, for the tournament's low round to put Tech in the conversation with Virginia and Northwestern. They came storming back uh, and all four scorers on the final day were under par. So I would say that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I don't know a lot about golf, but I hear under par. And generally, I'm impressed. Yeah. Um, I also know your golf game, and it's generally not under par. So. Oh, no. It, it's far above par. Um, but uh, Steelman, uh, Forrester, Howe, and Lamprecht, that being Ross, Bartley, Connor, and Christo, to uh, actually use their full names, uh, were all under par, as we said, with Steelman finishing just a stroke behind Virginia's Fostick uh, for the individual leader, and then Forrester and Howe both tying for seventh. To round out uh, the top 10 behind a trio of Liberty boys who were all in fourth. So I'd say pretty good. I'm not making the obvious joke there. I already made it once and you let it slide uh, before when we were putting together the shot sheet. And I'm kind of disappointed that you let it slide. You know what? That's 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 all right, I think. Um, looking at the season this fall as a whole so far, uh, it's our second win in three tries. Uh, 67th win under Hepler. So all in all, I would say quite a strong showing so far this fall and we'll get them out on the course a couple more times and one more note I have that isn't on our shot sheet I would be very interested to see where we wind up in uh, uh, golf stat the Sagarin uh, computer rankings all of the polls all oh, of the polls they'll be released for the first time in a couple weeks so uh, so yeah and uh, that'll be interesting to see where they shake out we just need predictive analytics for golf it's, I feel like we say that about many sports, but nevertheless, um, speaking of other sports. Uh, Move on! Cross-country time. Alexander Asics in Vite. Tech finished uh, medium, like you like you wrote down here. I think it, it's hard to take away a lot of things from these early season meets, right? There's a lot, lot of bigger stuff on the schedule. 
Well, and it's also, but at the same time, right? There's not that many meets on the schedule, especially in the fall. So we'll get we'll get into this when we talk about swimming a little bit more too. But um, this meet uh, rings a lot like uh, kind of the swim meet we saw this week, where you know it's still mid season. You're not necessarily running your A plus plus lineup. Um, in, in that case, that will absolutely be something we talk about when it comes to swimming. But um, it was good to get uh, a lot of different folks in uh, into a starting position and getting them some meat experience. And uh, and yeah, Sarah Copeland was named the ACC Co-Freshman of the Week for the second time this season. So good to see them. Incredible reloading. picture, by the way. Incredible action shot that Georgia Tech Georgia Tech Athletics does does their athletes. Sometimes just absolutely no favors with the uh, with the action shots that they choose. I want to see that picture again if you have it. I don't have it up in front of me, but I, you know, just crop the Samford girl out and 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 let it ride. That's that's all it takes, man. It's simply incredible. So congrats to Copeland. Uh, I I don't know if you mentioned it, but it was her second of the season. So yeah. um, things are things are looking good. And then you had this whole Twitter rant about. The tech, the tech cross country, the women's side's poll rankings that I want you to expand upon. Well, see, that's the thing. With with how we kind of see the cross country season shake out, um, a lot like, I guess, some more famous football-related uh, poll incidences where you're like, wow, someone's overrated, someone's not rated. Poll inertia. Yes. Um, it seems like Georgia Tech's only problem that they've had so far this year, or at least in the last couple of weeks, is just, you know, being in, in the South or not running, I guess, a meet on other people's radars. Like, I, I don't really get what the issue is. They, they've been they've been fine, uh, no different than in the past, and, and really have not gotten their due reward um, to show for it in terms of, I guess, you know, the, the poll rankings. But it's not all about rankings, so... Oh, well. He says um, it's not all about rankings. However, I do want to bring up uh, something our very own Stephen Murphy tweeted in response to your rant. Uh, Lady Jackets ain't run alongside nobody. Consequence, Paul. Anyway, uh, I thought that was funny. It was a, it was a very good it was a very good bit. Um, Paul Feinbaum, still yeah. on SEC Network. Never change, buddy, except maybe change a lot. Um, <laughs> let's talk. Let's switch gears before we move on to volleyball, which I think is the biggest news of the last two weeks. Um, and just finished, actually. Uh, let's talk about women's basketball recruiting for a second because I think there are some hot topics there. Um, Kara Dunn, four star out of per Mount Perrin, Georgia, um, committed to Tech earlier today. I think like literally two hours ago at the time of recording. We're recording this at 4.30 Eastern. Um, yeah, a couple hours ago, committed to Tech. Uh, she is the number 60th overall recruit according to and I cannot believe I'm reciting these words out loud, ESPN's Hoop Girls, that's girls spelled with a U and a Z, uh, top 100 recruiting rankings. Um, ESPN, sometimes I don't understand how they want us to take them seriously with women's sports. They, like This kind of stuff is just ridiculous. But they're the only recruiting rankings that I could find offhand, so we're gonna get, roll with them. Uh, that's a good get, that's a top 60 recruit, like I said. Um, in the nation, uh, she will join number 24 overall recruit Tony Morgan, who's a point guard out of, and again, incredulously, Florida High School in the state <laughs> of Florida. Point guard of 5'10. I, for one, cannot believe that that's real, but you know what? I, I had about two minutes before we started recording this to actually look up if Florida High School existed. So if it does, I apologize to Florida High School. If it does not, wow, that, that's a great domain game, domain name to get first, you know? Like, if, if you're gonna be a, a Florida High School, you might as well be Do they, the Florida High School, God, you, you know? You took my joke set up. Do you think that oh. they call themselves the Florida High School? Oh my the God. HS? Yeah, it exists. No, 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 no. That's, the, that's, oh. the, that's their recruiting website. Uh, no. Well, what? Mm. Hmm. Okay, we're gonna have. To, I'm, I'm looking it up. You keep. We, we, we're gonna have to spend some time doing some research here. Uh, but, but it's a good get. I think on the. I don't know if you're gonna find it. <laughs> it may just be a placeholder. It, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe they. Just it's it's possible. It's a placeholder. Um, I think this is a good get. Uh, even if you look, even aside from the recruiting rankings, I think if you look at the class holistically, at least from oh, these two. Oh, 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 I found it. 
Uh, Florida State University School is often referred to as Florida High School or that Florida is. High, though it actually serves grades K through 12. So it sounds like it's the U Chicago Lab School, translating it to Jake terms, um, but for FSU. So Tallahassee, baby. Uh, that's a that's a big get, actually, right under FSU's nose, and we know that FSU has a good, to, I mean, a pretty good women's basketball program. Yeah. So yeah. Hmm. Things to things to look at in ACC territory. I, I, like I was saying, it's it's a good get in terms of you know the the class that they're putting together, especially when you're talking about the pieces that they have to replace after this season. Yep. Right. Because you brought back after the COVID, you you, you brought back Kira Fletcher and um, Lorella Lorella Kubai, but you now have to replace them. Lodemai. And Lodemai and a couple other pieces next year. You have some depth, and you actually you have a lot of depth, like we saw last year. Um, and and you have a couple of freshmen rotating in now that you, you you can also take advantage of, especially during the early part of the season that non-con other than UConn uh, to rotate in. But um, I think these are you know filling some gaps here and there, and, and these are good gaps. Yeah, and and they only really lost one to the transfer portal, so that is. That is solid. It's an embarrassment of riches, and and when you consider things like you know obviously these recruits are a little bit further away, but say an example of Sarah Bates coming back from injury, you didn't have her for the vast majority of the ACC schedule. You didn't have her for the postseason, the ACC or the NCAA tournaments. At that point, that's like getting a whole nother player without having to you know change who's who the scholarship is going to. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's somebody who's been in the program, been in the system uh, for at least uh, over a year now. Um, have some other great transfers coming in. Um, one via Syracuse, which is a program that we have touched on before and don't need to again. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a good time to be women's basketball and it's great to see, uh, I guess, Nell Fortner, even though I guess this is still kind of early in her recruiting cycle and building those relationships, right? As, as have, having only been here for two years. Um, yeah, it, it's great to see. I, I think that'll that'll help with having even more uh, with having even more years under her belt, and, and hopefully we can put something together for next year as well. Um, given that I'm not a women's uh, basketball recruiting expert, I don't know how this all shakes out, but uh, in the grand scheme, but hopefully it is uh, hopefully it's good. I don't know. It sounds good to me. Two both rated in the top sixty is is very solid. Uh, so while well, while Jake was talking, I pulled up the uh, top twenty five recruiting rankings for twenty two. I think this is twenty two. No, this 21. is twenty one. Boo! Release a twenty two class ranking. <sighs> is it this? They have a terrific twenty five for twenty twenty four. This 24. is just ridiculous. Anyway, this is. Not, I I thought that, that was going to be useful. It was decidedly not useful. Um, but but they've been doing well on the recruiting trail the last couple of years. Right, we we talked in the the season before Nell got here. We talked about this program having its best recruiting classes possibly in history. Right, there was a number seven yeah. recruiting class in there. Um, that you know, there's pros and cons to what happened to it, but based on some of the coaching uh, the situation situation, I think is the best way to put that. Yep. Uh, the way that the coaching situation played out, there's some pros and cons to what happened, but the, but the fact of the matter is that you, Tech was able to pull in that talent and able to convince that talent both domestically and internationally to come to, to, come to Atlanta, right? So continuing to have the success on the recruiting trail, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Both pulling recruits, pulling transfers in from like from Syracuse, pulling recruits in from, from overseas, like, we, like Finland, like uh, like Spain. Italy, like Spain, um, and then also you know pulling in recruits from from uh, right under from uh, rivals' noses, like in Tallahassee. So okay. it's it's only success that we're talking about. I don't know why or how or what um, we were able to kind of build some of this over the last couple of years, but just the the energy seems to be trending in the right direction. The fan base engagement. Um, interest in you know playing the louisville's the nc states the fsu's the notre dames like it i don't know like at least in my opinion it seems like people are just talking about it um talking about it more and that's exciting to see too talking about the jackets you say (laughs) yep better than talking about the knolls uh 
I'm gonna switch gears again on our shot sheet. Let's talk about swim dive because I know you have some words, and I really want to build up the uh, the tension of these volleyball results to make people listen until the end. Yeah. Uh, Tech played or swam against NIAA SCAD down in Savannah, which is always a very curious meet. Why does it exist? I do not understand. We'll get. I'm there. sorry. I I try not to be too hard or have too strong of emotions for, for any of the decisions that these programs make. I love Georgia Tech, they're all wonderful people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like, what advantage, for, uh, for all the years I've been writing, uh, covering non rev sports, I do not understand why we swim against an NAIA school. I just do not see the point. Like, you only have so many meets in the year. Like, <laughs> it's basically an inner squad. Yeah. You, uh... Like, you, I'd rather see us swim against D3 Emory Crosstown meet against the D three the best program in D three by a country mile. Like, what what are we doing here, guys? We do do the Emory meet occasionally. Oh yeah, it's been on the schedule before. I'm pretty sure it's on the schedule this year. I I thought I saw it. Um, I don't think so, but I have to get back and check. Um, But look, the the score on the men's side was one hundred six to twenty three. The score on the women's side was one hundred eight to twenty three. Why there's a two point discrepancy there? I'm sure you can explain. I bet it's something diving related, or something tie related, or or something along those lines. But when you're taking a you know the king's ransom of points here, king queen monarch's ransom of points here, um, it's difficult. Like, look, I'm not saying SCAD is the definition of ain't played nobody, but at the same time, when you have a very tough conference that you're swimming against on average, I think you got to play somebody. Yeah, really. And looking at ahead at the schedule, um, it's great to see more ACC teams on it than usual. We have Auburn, we have Northwestern, but like Queens University Royals, that's a D2 school in Charlotte. Um, again, great, great to see Arkansas on there, Tulane, Gardner-Webb, if you're gonna, you know, just flesh out the schedule a little bit more. But man, like, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, because I, and I get it, you're gonna have meets where you swim off events. Maybe Savannah's just a, a fun place to go, or like a trip. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The, an, I think it's completely legitimate for us to have these questions, but we also need to nip that in the bud so we can talk about the actual very successful things that we saw this weekend that make me very excited okay. about the rest of the year. All right, go for it. All right, um, thank you for letting me get that little rant in. Scad's men have traditionally been stronger uh, than their women. Same with our. Uh, like our men and women's kind of divide that we've seen. It's telling that both scores were, you know, 106 to 23, 108 to 23, right in the same ballpark. Um, Georgia Tech's men's swim team has been a top 25 caliber team for the last five, six, seven years running pretty consistently. Um, that being said, uh, the women are not that far off this year, at least from what we've seen so far. Uh, Definitely Tajidis. Uh, Tajildis. Tajildis. Sorry, I'm not. I, we I practice need to work this on one. my Turkish. We even practice. We this. practice this one. Come on, <laughs> come on. Um, but uh, her her main event, 200 flies, the the big one that she swam again. Like we said, uh, swimming off events means that not everyone is necessarily swimming all their number one uh, events. Um, but uh, to be in the top ten in program history in your first swim of an event. Uh, and to be right on the edge of breaking two minutes, that is a great place to be. Uh, Rachel Fulton and Sophie Murphy, uh, freshmen as well, just off program top tens in the 50 free and 100 free, respectively. This is very good. Uh, all three of them are freshmen. It's a good sign of a rising tide for the ladies. Um, this is a good metaphor. Yeah. Very on brand metaphor. Again, uh, it, it's one of those things. It's We've seen this great success for the men for a while, um, and, and we'll talk about. Uh, a couple of the men's freshmen that we want to highlight in a second here, uh, but like it, it's not even restocking and reloading for the women. It is building from a solid base, and and they've gotten some transfers in. Uh, their sophomores were looking good last year, but to get uh, you know one of one of Turkey's best lady swimmers, um, as well as some very good uh, domestic recruits to round it out. You know, you, you can't bring in 40 kids every year, but if you're if you're bringing in five, six solid swimmers, um, this is what we need to build that base. So, good. Uh, I want to add one thing. When you said very, I want to emphasize that you had five 
E's for Barry yeah. on the shot sheet. Oh yeah. Uh, so he's very excited if it's not coming over uh, over audio. Podcasting is always is a visual medium. Uh, let's talk about the men real quick, as you alluded to. Matt Steele, 200 breast time, uh, two minutes, three seconds, 62 milliseconds. Uh, I'm going to be very technical about these times because podcasting is fun. Uh, Mert Kilovus, 500 free, four minutes, 35 seconds, and a nice 69 milliseconds. What are your thoughts on these? What, what, I mean, I have no context because I didn't do, I didn't swim in college, so I, mean, I, I swam club. But <laughs> that that five hundred free times uh, about probably a half a minute faster than than what I was throwing out at the end of my club time. But um, it's great to see uh, both Steel and Kilavus, uh contributing right from the start again. Uh, with with the men, uh, our note on here was they all swam uh, the the existing. Uh, you know, great stars that we've spent a lot of time talking about. So we really wanted to focus on our freshmen, and it is great to see the two of them getting in, uh, getting in the mix, uh, winning events. That is, that's what you want to see, and it's it's kind of refreshing not to see Kyle Pamputis being uh, the 200 breast winner for the Jackets. But uh, hopefully, that means that we can restock and reload because they're they are looking at a future that is coming soon. Without you know Christian Ferraro, Kyle Pamputis, um, some of these long-standing stars and you know, we need to get some some new blood in the pool. So good squad for them. Squad rotation. Yes. Exactly. Squad rotation. It's a World Cup qualifying weekend. Anyway, um, switch right before we switch gears. Uh, they are back in action later this month. Uh, you have it on here as the twenty third versus FSU in a duel. Is that home or away? That is home. Uh, Macaulay Aquatic Center. They're giving away pink shirts for the first two hundred fans. Those pink shirts. Either one shrink very easily, or two are a little bit smaller than you would expect. If I remember, correctly. I have a skin tight pink shirt from a couple years ago. I think it's they're I think small. It was FSU as well, but they're, they're, yeah. they uh, they run a little small. So uh, if you want one of those, um, go size up. This is uh, a great meet. I, I know that swimming does see FSU as a big rival. It's one of the few teams that we consistently can say that we've swam against them in a dual meet. I think for the better part of the last twenty years. Um, so yeah, uh, again, this is this is one of the big ones to pencil in terms of non-championship uh, or invitational meets. So if you're around on a Saturday missing football, um, yeah, that'll that's be the twenty third. What, what Saturday at eleven? Uh, that's a UVA kickoff weekend. I think. Yep. Eh, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what time that game is. So go I forward. also think it's away, so it might not matter. It is uh, homecoming the next weekend. So. Woo! Um, I had one more thing I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Uh, how does FSU lose at Georgia Tech this time? Will it be a fumble in the red zone, or will it be a blocked field goal? So, I, I honestly, I, I think it's a little weird to say a swim team is out for blood, but uh, based on how close uh, the meet was last year on the road, uh, their first competition out of COVID, just narrowly losing um, to the Seminoles, <laughs> Georgia Tech's going to want this, so it should be very exciting. Should have a lot of, a lot of emotion, a lot at stake for the first big meet of the year. I want, I really want you to play the the Fox baseball sound like we were talking about. I do, I don't do it because I don't know how it's going to come across on the on the audio. I'm about to hit play. Okay, well, it didn't play. It's muted. Okay, never mind. Oh, what a absolutely. Dreadful transition. Uh, speaking of dreary first weeks or <laughs> dreary initialisms, <laughs> volleyball. Oh man, uh, I was at the Notre Dame game live last week. That was that was tough. Lost in five sets despite being up two nothing. Uh, that was rough. Notre it was Dame, a rough, 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 rough watch. Notre Dame and Tech have had just fantastically entertaining games over the last. Three, four years. Entertaining is definitely one way to describe them. The uh, the last time we played Notre Dame at home uh, was fall 2019, and everyone left the building chant- chanting uh, NCAA. Um, <laughs> we all know how that one worked out, um, but it was a, a top 25 fringy Notre Dame team that we did the reverse to, so I guess we had one coming, but uh, you know, they made adjustments after kind of getting throttled in the first set, and then, and then Tech uh, edging them in the second. Um, obviously, when when games get emotional and hard, uh, as a fan, uh, I'm going to be very like, oh, nothing's going our way, refs and, and, and things like that. Oh, he was very upset. 
It, he was I, very I upset. I don't think you can. It, I don't think it's fair or right to just blame it all on that. So I'm not going to. Um, I will say they made tremendous adjustments, and uh, you know you don't win a set by ten just because of refs. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, it, it was tough. Um, again, Louisville, pro, 03, uh, a sweep is definitely not uh, as tight as the game implied. They did go to 36-34 in the second set. Uh, which is an emotional heartbreaker of a way to lose. Um, and that win did catapult Louisville to number one in the country in the Massey, uh, the Massey rankings, uh, which are a, I mean, Massey. They're descriptive. They're, Massey, they're not predictive, they're descriptive. I was going to say, Massey ranks everything. Um, everything. everything. Like, like college soccer, NAIA football, everything. Very useful. Oh, it's. We'll add. Yeah. But it, you have to always take those with a grain of salt. But it is worth saying that it, it, it was. Much closer than the box, uh, the box implied, and uh, yeah, it was honestly last week was a bit of a, a tough week. Top it was a downer, sports, so uh, downer. So that's why we're pivoting to the exciting, fun talk today, uh, which is uh, how do we say? Do we bury the lead on this? We're gonna bury the lead because I want to say one more thing about the Notre Dame and Louisville weekend. So Notre Dame came into that game uh, three and nine which obviously doesn't look that great on paper, especially when you consider that Georgia Tech took a loss. But you have, to, you have to understand that this is a Notre Dame team that came in as a projected, came into the season projected fourth, or to finish fourth in the conference. Wow, yeah. English is hard. They've had so, sledding in the non-con. Yeah, so. so the non-con really bit them, in the, bit them in the behind as you decided to chug an Arizona iced tea. Um, so it's not, to me, it doesn't seem, like, to me, it's a bad loss if you look straight at the record, but if you look at the competitiveness of the team and also the adjustments that Notre Dame made, when we're talking those adjustments specifically, it was more, they got a lot more aggressive on the blocks, a lot more aggressive up front. They started pairing blocks too. Yeah, and, and, and that too. So when you when you have a team that has a lot of success up front at nailing down, like being getting really high on the net and crashing down, over the top and makes a lot of their money that way, both off of the power shots at the net and also just a tip drill, like sort of tap in trip drill kind of shots that, that they're going to struggle. And that's what happened in those last, last three sets. But, but at the same time, tech was competitive in all, but that last set. No, nope, right. it went down to 16, 14 in the, in the last set. Or, or there was that one set. set, set that was, yeah. 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 They were competitive in all, but one set laid on. So this is a situation where it's the margins, right? It's the, that adjustment, that adjustment was enough to tip that margin over. Louisville, I think Louisville also has the talent uh, talent advantage there. So um, there, there's two factors there. I, I will say, and, and you can't keep Aubrey Hamilton uh, down for a whole game. And like, she did that last year, too. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think two years ago, too. But just fan, fantastic outside hitting uh, from Louisville. Or not Louisville. From Notre Dame. Wow. Um, well, also Louisville, be, probably. I, but. <laughs> well... well we don't I, have to we, talk about we it. We wash out the Louisville one, but uh, again, Notre Dame played like they wanted it too, and you know that's that's fine. I've never seen an opposing team uh, taunt our fans with the the bouncing of the ball, and I respect that. You know, like they were they were feeling like they were having fun. So Notre Dame Notre Dame fans are weird. Uh, speaking of other things that I haven't seen, uh, have you ever seen a program only post eight points in a set? Oh, I. I think we had something similar against UVA last time we played them, but it's, I don't know. It, I don't know what UVA is doing in volleyball, but it ain't working. So. We're bearing the lead here. Tech swept UVA in the first game of this week, uh, 3-0. The final set here was 25-8. to In uh, UVA's home gym. In UVA's home gym, Tech rattled off, I think, 12 straight points off of Kayla Kaiser's serve. Uh, to, to really put a beating down on the Who's at home and... It was weird because UVA looked at least a modicum of competitive. I think I watched the, the, most of this match. UVA looked at least a modicum of competitive and keeping pace in those first two sets, especially the middle one. Um, I don't have the sheet in front of me, but in, especially in the middle one, they were sort of keeping pace. And then the bottom fell out in that last set. And I don't know what happened. I don't think Tech really made adjustments. It just was like the bottom fell out. Sometimes when you're you're playing to when you're playing up, it, it's it's tough, you know. It's like, tough to keep up the intensity, right? Mm-hmm. It, 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 especially when 
especially when you look like you have a chance in those first two sets. And, and I have to go back to really look at the scores, but I, I think that they belie a certain level of, or they, they lack a certain level of competitive, competitiveness if you look straight at the scores that just, that was there, but it's not shown in the actual number. And, and that's the thing too, is like, they say 2-0 is the most dangerous lead in sports. I, in I soccer. In soccer, in hockey. Um, but I think the same thing could be said to volleyball because you never really know if that second set is going to break the other team's back or if they're going to be backed into a corner and rattle off a set and suddenly they have momentum on their side. So it's it's really a... It, it's it's tough. I, I was thinking the same thing in, in the Notre Dame game. When we didn't put put away the third set, I was like... Mm, yeah, I don't know. I'm not feeling the vibe. But yeah, I, I, as a uh, noted uh, amateur statistician, I have to point out that momentum doesn't exist. But I, I see your point. Yeah. Uh, now let's talk about the actual big news of the day. Uh, Georgia Tech uh, upset number two Pittsburgh in five sets in their home gym. This is good for the biggest win in program history. Uh, biggest upset for the program since number 12 Penn State earlier this year, uh, number 8 Cal, and number 5 Nebraska in 2003, which is uh, unequivocally Tech's previous best ever season. Uh, this is the win that I feel like Tech has been looking for, searching for, on the brink of for the last three seasons, and mm-hmm. I feel that it is completely validating to say that they bounced back from uh, playing a great team and, and being in a tough situation last week uh, to turn in a monster uh, weekend this weekend. Monster, monster performance. And I think the, and I'll, I'll let you finish your, your soliloquy here, but the, I think the thing that we said going into the season is you, you split Louisville and Pitt. I, I, I think it's, you, we don't care how you split it, but you split that those two games and I think you're looking at a good here, right? Yeah, I think we play them both again too. So yeah, so you're setting yourself up at least partially for success here. Um, and if Pitt comes here, uh, I don't know if that's on the schedule. I haven't. I don't have that in front of me right now. I but, believe it is because they moved it to a 4 p.m. game on a Friday, which basically means it's going to be empty. Oh, um, it's also going to be on TV probably. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, they're going to be hungry for blood. So that's going to be fantastic. Uh, mm-hmm. But, but it, it's going to be weird. It's it, it, it's a weird feeling right um when you pull off something like this and especially that last set because this went to five this was a three two win this, this went to five and we've watched the last set here uh, here before recording it was wild uh tech had a lot of the challenge luck go go their way the late in that set yeah, i mean they were challenging dumb plays i don't think he, i mean wild. he was taking uh, pitt's coach dan orlovsky clone um uh, was taking a lot of uh, challenges to call timeouts but at the same time like, it's also the Kirk Ferentz approach of we're not going to leave. We can't take them on the bus with us. Well, not that they'd be on a bus because they're at home, but I gotta get. I mean, I'm take an L anyway. Uh, if it was Chicago, I'd say they'd take the L home anyway. Um, I thought that was a good one. My point is, it's, it's an. I think it's. I don't think this is an expectation reset moment. I don't think this is like a football style. Oh, have they proved proof of concept kind of deal, right? Because they have proof, proof, proof of concept. They were they did a that point early. away from winning this same similar setup Last at Pittsburgh in 2019. Yeah, in, in 2019, I don't, and and I think similar, kind of similar last year. I don't think it was a complete waxing last year either. I think they, I think it was four sets, but I can't remember. Yeah, but either way, it wasn't like a complete waxing. And and at the same time, I think you, if if Tech had just better in that Notre Dame game, they also pull that one back. And even if we decide the. Louisville game is a complete wash to the number one team in the country. Yeah, I, it, this has been a good season so far, unequivocally. Oh, yeah. um, they were at twelve in RPI last week, and that'll only go up having beat, you know. And they were ranked eighteen. And, and this is something that you touched on before we started recording. They were ranked eighteenth going into the Notre Dame Louisville week, and then we're still ranked eighteenth coming out of that week. So I think the pollsters are at least. The, the coaches poll is at least has the same idea of Notre Dame that we do when we're talking about, hey, this is a good team that had, that has had some bad breaks in the non-con, and then they're also tossing out that Louisville game in terms of evaluation. I'm pretty sure Notre Dame also was the second best team in the conference last year. Yeah, too. I think they were the conference runner-up last year, yeah. if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. So now you're talking about a team that, I, I don't know if they break into the top 10, but they at least break into the top 15 here. I don't see how you can go on the road to beat the 
a team that you have not beat since they joined the conference, a consensus top 10 team for the last five years in their home gym uh, in a gutty five set win and, and not give them margin of victory. I was going to say, at least not give them some sort of poll related bump. RPI will, will see that. Massey will see it. it it's, it's really just a question of how much, not if, I think. We're back to the BCS, baby. It's 2013. We only put two teams in the national championship. It's all about margin of victory. Okay, John Heisman in 2016, or 1916, but whatever. You blew that one. I uh, really did. It's fine. I, I think that there's more we can gush about this program, but I think we've done it in previous weeks. Yep. Um, everything that they usually do is was kind of on display here. They just ground this one out. Well, and, see, the thing is, too, about this week, they lost the first set and then came back and made adjustments, which is so surprising because I think the main takeaway from Notre Dame is that Notre Dame was the one that made the better adjustments, you know? Uh-huh. And, like, and I mean, they made fine adjustments versus Louisville, but it wasn't enough. That's and, a talent advantage thing, right? You can't yeah. win on them. I, I think when we're talking about Louisville, you, you, like I was saying earlier, you have a talent advantage. You yep. have a talent margin. You don't just have the tactical margin Yep. Uh, because the talent is equal. You also have the talent margin. The same thing is with Pitt, to be fair. Pitt yep. is, a, like we said, is the number two team in the country. But you, but when you take advantage of that tactical margin you and, 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 and grind out the result, there's something to that, right? It's mm-hmm. the same thing that Notre Dame did to us. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I I don't know if we were volleyball knowledge enough to actually say what the adjustment was, but what? with Notre Dame or no Dame? with Pitt with Pitt with Pitt. I was gonna say I was driving for the first two sets. I, could, I couldn't tell you um, what what they looked like other than they ended one one. But mm-hmm. you know that's what happens when you have to record a podcast on a Sunday afternoon. But. Um, Pacey, Pacey, Pacey. That's life. Um, but at the end of the game, they, they did look great. And it, it's one of those, you can tell things are going your way, and this is going to go against Mr. Statistician's uh, uh, vibiness. God, he's going to uh, say momentum. But I'm again. not going to say momentum. I'm going to say just uh, if you making, say vibes, I also will have Making big issue with plays, that. like when you're, you know, really re- reaching for that, uh, that set or that block, um, I don't know. It's, it seemed like they were getting that extra margin in, in terms of that range, and that's that's often what something can can go from from a close L to a close win is just making that that last play or that that last inch towards the ball or you know getting that slightly better mm-hmm. angle on a block like that that is completely uh, jives with what I saw down the mm-hmm. stretch in in this game. Yeah, and I think I, I keep doing this thing where I tie volleyball things back to football things that we've talked about, but when we're talking about rep, like reproducibility, right? It, it's not like they played a different game. It's not like they did certain things that Pitt wouldn't have seen. I think in a lot of these games, they played more or less, they made adjustments here and there, but the, the, the style of play has been the same, yep. right? They're and, playing and their game. They're playing their game, and, it, and and when we're talking about the biggest win program history, it's not because it was a fluke. It's because they played their game and they had success doing it, and Pitt just floundered yep. at, at, at certain points. So w- when we talk about reproducibility, this is something that, it's not that something that we want to see. Like It's not something that we say, hey, do it again versus the next big opponent. It's yeah. now that they've done it versus one opponent, like we know that they can do it versus other opponents. They don't have to prove that concept to keep barring football terms <laughs> again uh, and again. Is that where we pivot into football? We can. Uh, first first bit, uh, the next week, uh, their fixtures for next week, 10 13, uh, they'll be at Clemson. That's a 7 p.m. tip on ACC Network. And then that's on, on Wednesday? Yeah, that's a Wednesday. Okay. Um, and then they'll be hosting Duke on the 17th. That's a Sunday at 2 p.m. That'll be on RSN. That's Bally Sports South. So both of these are on real Atlanta. TV. Yeah, both of these are on real TV. Uh, well, I mean, Bally Sports South is a fake network, as we've discussed before. But good for them. They're on real TV. They deserve to be on real TV. Uh, speaking of other games that were on Bally Sports South. Good were, job. Were both of these games yeah. on Bally Sports, or was it? On I, I think it was both. I watched Pit Live. I, I don't. I don't know what TV it, uh, it was on. So. Well, one of these was miserable. Well, no, both of these were miserable, and they're on specific ways. We didn't talk about Pit last week. That was a twenty-four to fifty-two loss, I believe. I don't actually have the score in front of me, but it was a loss anyway. A miserable one, and then Tech beat Duke thirty-one to twenty-seven, and they similarly. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, grinding. 
Grinding would be the positive way to put it. Yes. I, so I don't want to talk about both of the games uh, specifically. I want to sort of talk about because because now we're at the six game mark. We're we're at the bye week. I want to talk about what this season has looked like as a whole and and some of the thoughts and feelings that we have here. Just to give us some context for this conversation in terms of rankings. Uh, ESPN FPI has Tech at 49th. Uh, SP Plus uh, has Tech at 57th with a 58th ranked offense, 47th ranked defense, and 102nd ranked special teams. So we're at the bye. We're at, we're halfway through the season. We're three and three. What what is your pulse on this season? What what are your thoughts about how the season has unfolded? I know we have some comments from the from, from the rest of the writers room, but I want you to go first. Three and three is exactly what I expected after six games, but the way we got there has been just a roller coaster. I, I think with with how we've played, it could be one and five or five and one in, in the margins there, and and that is a really strange place to be. I, I feel like the last two weeks we haven't necessarily played the brand of football we saw the two weeks before that, and mm-hmm. and just the the first two weeks were weird in their own way too. So. I, like I expected us to be at three and three, but it, it's kind of frustrating to not be more, and and also on some level surprising not to be less, which is a weird thing to say too. So. Yeah, I, I mean, like let's take take stock of the the game so far, right? So NIU, Kennesaw State, Clemson, UNC, Pitt, Duke were the six. We're yep. the six fixture, fixtures. NIU, that I mean, that's a one point loss in reality, but that could have gone either way. Yep. So you flip that one, and maybe you flip the Clemson one, and you're looking at a five and one team heading into the bye. But but that's a pretty shaky five and one team based that's on a what very, we saw against Pitt. Yeah, it's a shaky five and one team based on what you saw against Pitt. But you could also, by that same token, you could flip the Duke game back, yeah. mm-hmm. and you could say this is a two and four team heading into the bye. I don't think you can flip any of the other games really. No, I don't. Uh, I, 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 the other ones. Yeah. So it, it, you're. I mean, obviously, you're looking at five and one, two and four. It's you're in the middle of the possible outcomes, more or less. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this is kind of what kind of what we expected. But in terms of consistency, offensive play calling, defensive effort sounds like the wrong word, but just success. Like defensive it, effectiveness, it, I think, it, the word you want. It feels like it's just been all over the place, and like. Uh, again, uh, the proof of concept is the most overrated cliche. It's not an overrated would... cliche. It's just we've said it too often to where it feels like an overrated cliche. Yeah, but at the same time, my, my point being, I don't think you can say anything's proof of anything because we haven't seen this team do two things two weeks in a row mm-hmm. the whole season. Maybe you could call Clemson to UNC uh, two weeks in a row, but then you turn around and, and, and you're playing Face a, a lesser opponent in, in Duke and, and you can't pull out that that same kind of experience because y- you cannot tell me that that Duke and Clemson are on the same level this year. Well, you just can't. You they, can't. As, uh, if you look at the old uh, uh, ACC standings, Clemson is also 2-3, and three, if I am not mistaken. Uh, who did they play yesterday? They didn't play yesterday. They didn't play yesterday. Duke is 2-4. and four. All right. It's week 6. And Clemson's beat BC. Lost to NC State. Shit, did they... They're, uh, they're three and two. Well, logic is hard. Yeah. Um, I I don't think I, I agree. I don't think you could call Clemson and Clemson and Duke equal, even if my joke didn't land there. But it's been a where it's just been a frustrating season for me because and I think you said it. It's it's where we expected to be, but it's just the road to get there has been infuriating at points. Because while some mistakes from last season has, have been cleaned up, I think one of the things, like we've talked about, penalties have been cleaned up a lot. Yeah. Um, I've been pretty pleased with that. Um, the, the quarterback play has gotten at least a modicum of consistent, and we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. And some of the pressure, pressure generation in spots has gotten a little bit more consistent, but the... the, the but the main flaws of this team have been consistent over those three years yep. uh, of Jeff Collins, right? It, there's uh, this, the, the offensive line hasn't really improved, uh, and the secondary has consistently had trouble covering covering receivers in the passing game. 
Yep. Um, and and I don't I don't know enough about fo- about uh, American football tactics to, to sort of piece together the, the the solutions there, right? But these are consistent themes that you're seeing in each game, even in the wins. You're seeing these things peter out. Yep. Uh, and and it's frustrating to keep seeing that. And I and the more and I think one of the things that also comes into play is as the teams that we have either 50 50 or um, or beaten keep playing games it, it turns out that they're not as good as we thought they were right yeah. Clemson taking that loss taking the loss to NC State but also losing to uh, but also almost losing to BC um, yeah. that th- those are on the table and and just Clemson's lack of offensive identity and, and lack of offensive effectiveness that that's that's something to consider UNC having no sort of offensive line whatsoever almost. Is something that is something that's peter, that's uh, paired out so far this season. NIU got pasted by by Michigan, yeah, uh, 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 in what week two. So it, it's just hard to evaluate some of these things when, I mean, you're when you're playing football and trying to rank these teams, it's you're you're shooting a bullet while riding a horse to try to hit a moving target. Right. Yep. But it just like even despite that, the wins are not as good as they thought they were, and the losses are just bad in some in some yeah. cases. Uh, again, to double back to the high level narrative of proof of concept, is this going to work out? I just I think the jury's still out. Right. I have no idea how to evaluate this, like you said, because they haven't done two. They haven't followed the patterns into in the same week or in the same two weeks yeah i agree other than they haven't followed the good patterns in the same two weeks yeah and and you want to be you want to be looking at the good patterns in, in terms of making strides towards success like you can you can be consistently bad at something and that's not that's not productive um so i would i would agree there um in terms of how the rankings see us it looks like fpi has us at 49th uh, sp plus one over the rankings at Boo. 57th Repeating. So my point here is going to be, we seem to be aggr- aggressively in the middle of the pack. Aggressively middling. Yes. I was going to say, uh, there's another term for it, but that's a little bit more negative than I want to be. Exactly. So um, is that where we saw the team being in the big picture? This is fine. I, I think our thesis here is that this is where we expect it to be. Yeah. Right? I, I'm fine in... In 2021, as if they finish the season in between 40 and 60 in SP+, I'm kind of okay with it. But at a certain point, and I think I saw this on Twitter with a, for a lot of teams that are in that in a similar range, yeah, you need to win the games. And I, and Nishan in, in our writers room actually notes this notes this as well. The next four games before you hit the before you hit the end of the slate here are potentially winnable games. You need to win three of those to make a bowl. So number one, which three of those are, are, are they going to be? This is a rhetorical. Which three of them are they going to be? What are the consequences of not hitting not hitting at least five yeah. and making the bowl game? Or, or, not, or not hitting five. What are the consequences of not hitting five like we said at the onset of the season? I just... It, it's also tough when you talk about comparing Jeff's performance. Jeff Collins is win and loss record to other coaches that have been what's the word I'm looking for? Panned. Panned is probably the most politically correct way to put that. Uh, panned by by the fandom. When you're comparing it, Bill Lewis had what? He had 10 wins in three years? I think it was yeah, 10. 10 I, I, win? 10. I don't know what it was. It was right there, but he got canned mid-season. So. He got canned mid-season after three, after, I mean, two and a half or three in the middle of the fourth season, right? So, and and Jeff is at I mean eight, right? Yeah. Eight, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to be negative to the point that we're comparing him to a coach who's a decent sized chunk of our fan base refuses to type out his full name. But, but, but well, my point is that I'm not trying to make that comparison. But yeah, like I think. But my point at the end of the day is you have to win the games. Yeah. It, it, you can. You can 
keep doing this thing where you say, oh, we see these good things that we are doing. Sometimes they work. Um, we see the patterns. We, we, see, we, we see the vision. We can see the vision all we want, but at a certain point, you have to, the vision has to be tangible. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so. It, it, there's a lot more feedback yeah. here, but, but the, the main point, and I think every one of the writers sort of agrees on this, is you have to win the games. Next four are winnable. Let's look up the schedule while it's I have it open. UVA, Virginia Tech. Okay. Well, the other Boston part of College, the College, Miami, Notre Dame, why are Georgia. You, why are you ruining my bit? Well, it's not really a bit. It's set up. All right. So, like he said, at Virginia, at home versus te- Virginia Tech, at Miami, at home versus Boston College, away to Notre Dame, and then clean old-fashioned hate on Thanksgiving. So, you look at the next four that are ahead. Virginia has no semblance of a defense, to put it mildly. Uh, Virginia Tech has been one of the weirdest teams I've ever watched play a football season this year. Uh, Miami is, you can't see this, I'm shrugging, podcasting is a visual medium, and Boston College is good. So, really, even if you strike out Boston College on the 13th, you have three winnable games immediately in front of you coming out of the bye. Jeff Collins has never won two games in a row, and the, to get us bowl eligible by the Boston College game would require going... Winning three four, of four. In, including, oh, yeah. including yesterday's game, four in a row. Yeah. Yep. That's gonna be a, f- gonna be a fun couple weeks. Yeah, that's all I got. That's really all I got. I, I mean, I don't want to be. I don't want to be depressing. I don't want to be doomer, doomerish. But like, gotta win the games. Yep. Like, it, it, at a certain point, wins and losses count. And you have like, I, I don't think that we're we've we're moving the goalposts. I don't think that we are being we are being hypocritical in terms of where we were at the beginning of the season because we said at the beginning of the season five wins is sort of the bar, right? Yeah. Five the, the, and the way that the ACC Coastal has been, five wins is incredibly achievable because there are no good teams in the Coastal other than Pittsburgh. Even if you take Pittsburgh as a mulligan, you still have four games here. Well, three Coastal and then plus the uh, plus the Atlantic crossover, where you can prove that you can be the second tier team mm-hmm. in the Coastal, and that is your proof of concept, right? Your concept is to be better. <laughs> Your concept is to be is to be punching up into that coastal top spot. Yep. This is your opportunity to prove that. So figure it out is what is what I got. Cool. Anything else to finish us out here? Nope. I think we're good. Okay. We uh, U.S. World Cup qualifier in like an hour and a half. What do you got? Give me a pick here. Uh, America. Let's go with that. I don't know anything about Panama, so. I'm playing in Panama, so mm, we'll see. Cool, we'll see you all next week.